In the absence of government intervention to make rates higher than zero, the interest rate will stay at zero permanently. And what we've had is this talk about financial repression where they're pushing rates down to zero, which would otherwise be higher. It's completely the opposite. Okay, if the government does nothing, rates go to zero. They have to take action to push rates higher. So it's not necessarily to say that the policy rate should be zero. But it is to say that in the absence of intervention, the policy rate is zero. If you start with that base case and you raise rates, some of those asset prices will adjust to the higher rate and come down. Okay, and then if you go back to the zero rate, then they'll go back to where they were in the base case. I think it's totally misleading to call that asset price inflation because they went back to where they were to begin with. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard our guest this week, MMT founder Warren Mosler. And in a moment, we're going to be talking to him about the MMT view of interest rates, the Inflation Reduction Act, and some recent New York Times coverage of Warren's ideas. If you're new to MMT, you can listen to our first three episodes for an introduction. But if you want to dive in here, as regular listeners will know, what we use as money in many, if not most places in the world today dollars, pounds, yen, zloty, etc. These tokens are not dug up out of the ground or plucked from a tree, neither are they promises to pay the bearer on demand a certain quantity of precious metal. Rather, it's the need to acquire these tokens to pay taxes with that make them valuable to currency users like you and me. And that's precisely why currency issuing governments impose tax liabilities on their citizens to get us to need the currency they issue. And they issue that currency by spending it into existence to buy real resources, materials and labour to achieve the things they were voted into office to do. And for more specifics on the payment system, you can listen to our episode 13 entitled Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Banking But Were Afraid to Ask. Another insight is that when a nation has its own floating exchange rate currency, that currency is a simple public monopoly and the government is the monopoly issuer. And so what that currency is worth in real terms is therefore a function of prices paid by government when it spends. Now, if that sounds a bit technical, imagine just in theory, a country that pays someone to be its head of state, but it's just a ceremonial role. The person in the job has no real power. And so they only get paid £7.50 an hour. If that was the pay rate, the government would be saying that one pound is worth eight minutes of purely ceremonial activity. Then imagine someone new coming into the job and negotiating a pay raise and getting double, so 15 pounds an hour. The government would then be saying a pound is worth only four minutes of purely ceremonial activity, revising the value of a pound down by 50% in real terms. Now, these are just numbers I've used to keep things simple. If there were such a country in such a situation where pro-labor, we'd support the National Union of Ceremonial Workers and hope that they got paid much more than £15 an hour, especially during a cost of living crisis. But anyway, in the conversation that follows, you'll hear us talk about our friend and regular guest Sam Levy's work, which models how private sector prices respond to the state being in this price setting role. And I think Warren agrees with Sam's mathematical model but questions what he calls a narrative that goes along with the model. We didn't really have time to follow up on any potential points of difference. So in the show notes, I've linked to our last episode with Sam, which is excellent in my totally unbiased opinion. And he talks about the model in plain terms. That's our episode 125 entitled Monopoly, Monopsony and What to Do About Them. And on the topic of the state as price setter, I've also linked to our episode 123 with Warren entitled Understanding the Price Level and Inflation. And just before we dive in, 
a reminder that Professor Bill Mitchell's online MMT 101 course will be running again from the 14th of September to the 12th of October. It doesn't matter if you join the course later than the launch date. It's a part time course and they estimate you'll need four hours a week to complete it. So you'll have plenty of time to catch up if you join part way through. And I've linked to where you can find out more about that in the show notes where, as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. And no matter what level of support you give, you get early access to all of our episodes and patron only episodes. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we're delighted, as we always are when this happens, to be joined today by MMT founder Warren Mosler. Thanks for joining us today, Warren. Uh, Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. Let's get straight into it. We wanted to help people understand interest rates. And if you could cast your mind back to 1997, when you and Matt Forstatter wrote a paper called The Natural Rate of Interest is Zero, can you remind our listeners what you mean by that phrase? Right. So um, with a floating exchange rate policy, which all the major currencies in the world have right now, in the absence of government intervention to do something to make rates higher than zero, they will be at zero. And the government intervention that is commonly used to keep rates above zero are interest on reserves and treasury securities. So in the absence of treasury securities, in the absence of paying interest on reserves, at an operational level, the interest rate will stay at zero permanently. And when we say the natural rate is zero, we're just talking about one interest rate, which is the rate, the base rate, the rate at which commercial banks lend central bank reserves to each other. We're saying if the government doesn't do something to cause those commercial banks to need to lend central bank reserves to each other. To need to borrow, yeah, then uh, the rate will stay at zero. And so um, unless they offer an alternative account that pays a higher rate of interest, then they'll all shift to that account and the rate will go higher. So it's not necessarily to say that the policy rate should be zero. But it is to say that in the absence of intervention, the policy rate is zero. And what we've had is this talk about financial repression where they're pushing rates down to zero, which would otherwise be higher. It's completely the opposite. Okay, if the government does nothing, rates go to zero. They have to take action to push rates higher. Otherwise, they won't go up. They'll stay at zero. So when we talk about permanent zero interest rate policy, we're talking about this short-term interbank lending rate what's called the base rate here in the UK and the Fed's fund rate in the US being zero permanently. That's what ZERP is. Yeah, it's the cost of funds for the banking system, the marginal cost of funds, their cost of money uh, from the central bank. So it's just that rate that we're talking about. And I'm just thinking about how regular people, home buyers, small businesses, savers, how they experience interest rates. So on top of the cost of funds for banks, so let's say a bank's cost of funds is zero. Well, they need to make a little bit of a spread to cover overhead and whatnot. And And they also are taking risk because you might not pay your loan back. So what you have are risk-adjusted interest rates. The risk-free rate, the central bank rate, that's zero in this example. And uh, so mortgage rates uh, where rates are zero are probably somewhere around 3 or 3.5%, maybe a little bit less. Again, for example, you can look at Japan, you can look at the European Union with the uh, zero policy rates, the U.S. when we had zero policy rates. So home mortgages were around 3%, which reflects the risks and the costs of giving people loans. And as someone who used to own a bank, what factors go into determining interest rates that get offered to bank customers, borrowers and savers? I I know you kind of touched on it just then, but maybe just go from the ground up. It's fairly simple in in practice because you know what the other banks are charging. And you know, if you charge more, you're probably not going to get very much business. So the decision is whether to charge the same or less. And then you look at whether it's worth it from a risk standpoint. And more often than not, it was not worth it. (laughs) So uh, the Banks' loans, from what I was calculating at the time, were at rates where the banks were going to lose money. And they didn't lose the first day or the first year, but as soon as any kind of a crisis hit, they all lost all of their capital because their lending standards were much too lax, You know, in, in my humble opinion as a banker. Very often in progressive circles, there is a a very common kind of condemnation as uh, maintaining interest rates so low. You know, they don't frame it as the natural rate, but they frame it actually that the central bank has been intervening to maintaining rates low and QE and all this. And they blame that for increasing asset prices. 
and almost exclusively uh, highlighted as a mean cause of wealth inequality. The higher rates exacerbate the wealth inequality issue because people who already have money are getting more money through interest. And the higher the policy rate, the more interest they get. People without money don't get it. So on the surface and as a fact, the higher rates directly are a direct subsidy to people who already have money. I call it basic income for people who already have money. And so I would disagree with progressives who have that position. I think they're completely missing the point. Often what they mean by that is exclusively house prices, isn't it? I'm not sure. You know, the ones I talk to and I ask them what they mean, they get a kind of a fuzzy answer. But if you look at Japan, they had zero rates for 30 years. They didn't have the kind of asset price inflation or whatever these people term the increase in asset prices. So I look at the zero rate policy, which is the cost of funds policy, as a base case for purposes of analysis. That's where the money story starts. The government imposes a tax liability, and then people come to work to earn the tax credits, the money they need to pay the tax and to net save. And uh, there's no interest you know, at that point. And there'll be a, a certain level of savings that people will have, even with zero interest policies, as evidenced by Japan and the U.S. and the Eurozone, and we had zero interest rate policies. And you'll also get a certain level of asset prices, and it's not an accelerating level of asset prices. Asset prices in Japan have been very stable. You, know, you didn't have any accelerating asset prices in the European Union, even when you had negative interest rates. And so that argument to me doesn't make any sense. Now, if you start with that base case with asset prices at a certain level and you raise rates, some of those asset prices in the first instance will adjust to the higher rate and they will come down. Okay. And then if you go back to the zero rate, then they'll go back to where they were in the base case. So I think it's totally misleading to call that asset price inflation because after you raised rates and brought them back down, that they went back to where they were to begin with. So I, I, it makes no sense to me. And where they settle out at is some kind of a risk-adjusted basis, the same as I was talking about for uh, you know, the rate on loans adjusted to a risk-adjusted basis. And so have Having asset prices at a risk-adjusted basis, I think, is certainly a reasonable starting point, my base case for analysis. And the burden of proof is on somebody who thinks we'll get better outcomes with a different interest rate. And so far, I've heard a good argument for it. The U.S. has other things that cause various asset prices to go up, other bits of institutional structure that perhaps uh, other countries don't have. So, for example, for a long time, we had full tax deductibility of all interest payments on housing. Well, of course, that's going to help support it. And you can go into all the other institutional structure that you know, would be supportive of home prices, for example. I've heard recently this idea when it comes to asset prices, they specifically highlight the risk of bonds, existing bonds, that is, going into its price increasing to infinity if the nominal interest rates fall to zero. So I think I heard a couple of people suggest that it may be better to leave them at the real interest rate zero rather than the nominal rate. Yeah, well, that's just flat out wrong. In fact, you've seen bonds in Japan that were maybe, you know, one, two, and three percent bonds when price to yield zero go to some premium, 110, 115, 120, they adjust in price and they don't go to infinity. The, the return at that price is zero because you gain the um, premium, but you lose the income and that's out to zero. So, you know, that's completely unfounded. I don't know where they got that idea. I've never heard that from anybody serious about, you know, anybody from the capital markets would never say that, for example, or anybody who understands bond mathematics would never say that. Yeah. And, and the thing is that, that's really struck me is that infinity is not a realizable number, is it? <laughs> and, and I mean, the, at worst, what could happen is that people wouldn't sell the bonds. Yeah. There's, well, there's no basis for that statement. They will go to where the yield of their bond is equal to the yield of new bonds. So if new bonds are yielding zero and they have a 3% bond, then, you know, it's a one-year bond that'll trade at approximately a 3% premium. We'll go to infinity. That's just interest rates 101. I mean, that's uh, not, there's no advanced mathematics or anything in that. So, look, a lot of people say I've personally, you know, destroyed the global economy because of, uh, we're all doing MMT or something like that. So, there's been a lot of absurd statements out there. <laughs> that's just one more of them. <laughs> you have personally done this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is this is in a world that has categorically rejected MMT, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's, but they're doing it, and uh, it's my fault. Something they've categorically rejected, it and clearly aren't doing a single policy that I'd ever recommend. But it doesn't matter, you know, to the people who want to say that they say it. It started, I think, a lot of it originated from Cato, you know, the right wing thing in Washington started talking about that as a talking point to help with the um, November elections here. 
where they thought people would you know, certainly believe it and that they said it in a believable way. And it was said to people who will believe anything they say and are pro-Republican, anti-Democrats. And I don't know, maybe it works to get votes, you know, something like that. So maybe this thing about going to infinity is working to get somebody's vote who wants higher interest rates. I don't know where it's coming from, but it's, there's absolutely no basis to it. Nobody's serious who would ever say anything like that. Well, look, the other thing is, let's say the bond prices do go up. Is that particularly helpful to the bondholder? So let's say you had a 3% bond and it's a two-year bond and rates go to zero. So now you can sell your bond maybe at 105, 106, something like that. Well, that's fine. But you know, you signed up at 3% and you're going to get just 3% for two years, whether rates go to zero or rates go to 10. And that's not going to change. Now, you might be able to get some money up front, but then when you reinvest your money, you're going to get zero. So it's still equivalent to getting the 3% you started with. So that contract gets honored. It stays there. Fine. And going forward, all your future income, your reinvestments are all going to be done at zero. So it's not like it's a big plus for existing bondholders, unless you have a leverage position and you were just making a bet on interest rates. You know, that, that's a different matter. But for actual investors, it doesn't matter one way or the other all that much. Just before we move on, there are some people out there on the internet, including Larry Summers, <laughs> who seem to think that anything that goes wrong in Turkey is the fault of MMT. The floor is yours, Warren. What do you think the Turkish Central Bank should be doing? Well, first of all, you know, this talk picks up as we approach Thanksgiving every year. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so but when you say should be doing, you know, how, how can we, what do you presume they're desired outcome is. If it's exporters who are in control trying to keep their costs down and optimize their profits, they're probably doing a pretty good job right now. <laughs> you know, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. So if their desired outcome was uh, full employment and low inflation and high levels of prosperity, sure, I can give you some recommendations, but that doesn't mean anybody in charge there has any desire for that outcome, right? <laughs> is it your feeling that the exporters are in charge? It's yeah. I think they're getting the outcome they want right now. And when they put these policies in place and people argue they're inflationary, I'm not so sure they don't want that. You know, nobody ever discusses that might be a possibility. What's interesting is when you get a lot of inflation, the government gets to pick winners. So they raise the minimum wage 50%, you know, regularly to make sure that those people are kept whole and that becomes their constituency for the next election. And they can keep those people perpetually ahead of a lot of other people and, you know, ensure their political status. So it's a political tool, right? And uh, so before you can give a recommendation, you have to know what the desired outcome is. I think what I'm maybe interpreting from what you're saying is that there is a conflict there and that the politicians really don't want to resolve that conflict, but rather they want to play to both bands without really solving this issue. So you can't please the exporters while at the same time increase the uh, minimum wage. Is that what you're saying? You know, they are regularly increasing the minimum wage. It's still relatively low. But that ensures that people earning a minimum wage keep up or stay ahead of inflation to the expense of other people who may be falling behind, right? Fixed income people or things like that who aren't working. And so it's continually affecting the distribution of real wealth and directing whatever proportion the politicians want towards minimum wage workers and people who make a spread off of minimum wage, so to wage earners. And those are probably their strong supporters. The uh, I think the administration gets pretty good popular support and it's figured out how to do that, it appears to me. So uh, before we, you're quick to criticize anybody for ignorance, take a closer look to make sure there isn't some design behind it, you know, we're not seeing. The reason why I say it is this, and maybe I'm a little bit off shooting here, but right now in the UK, we have this issue with energy and everybody knows that there's some shortages and the government doesn't seem to be doing anything other than just simply reducing taxes on, you know, doing things that will may be popular, but ultimately do not resolve the problem. Yeah. So I think the UK is very different in that regard from Turkey, right? <laughs> For now. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, structurally, obviously, the economy is very, very different. I'm just uh, interesting to see the same kind of political challenges in both places. Yeah. Well, I, again, I think they're very different, right? The political challenges are very different. I think exporters have always been, certainly in my lifetime, in control in England. L look who gets knighted, you know, the biggest exporters, right? People buy a couple hundred million Beatles records and they all get knighted, you know, overseas because they're, they're major exporters. And, you know, London's always been operating that way, right, as a center for that type of thing, particularly financial services and everything else. And so uh, that's the design of the country. 
Moving on to some recent media coverage, recently a New York Times columnist wrote about your idea that interest rates work backwards to the way that, let's call them trad economists, think interest rates work. Do you have any comment on that article at this point? Yeah, the interesting thing was he talked to Professor Michael Woodford from Columbia, who's the go-to economist for the Fed, speaks with them regularly. You know, he's at their conferences type of guy, and he's the guru of Keynesian monetary policy, monetary policy in general. He's the insider's insider on monetary policy. And in his response, he said, should the interest payments of the government become a problem? That stimulus, he called it a stimulus, which is what I've been saying, can be reversed with a tax increase or spending cut. Well, that's my whole point. What they're doing is a stimulus that, sure, could be reversed by a tax increase or spending, but that's not what they're doing. They're just doing the deficit spending flat out. So he supported that part, that you know what I was saying there. And then Paul Krugman, when they asked him about what he thought about Michael Woodford's comments, he says, well, he agreed with Woodford, which he wouldn't dare not agree with Woodford. <laughs> None of those guys would, because he's the one they look up to, and he's the one that's, he's the brains of that, what's called organization, the New Keynesian organization, and, and the whole uh, you know basis of Federal Reserve monetary policy. So that was enormously supportive. Now, the only one who did agree with Michael Woodford in the article was Peter Coy, who wrote the article, because he said earlier on, he disagrees with me. And then he went on to show how Michael Woodford agreed with me. So I guess he's kind of an outlier right now. But it was, I think, the first time that I've had what can be read as a constructive article in the New York Times. Uh, in the past, uh, Andy Lowry did an article not maybe 10 years ago, and it was just lies and fabrications and cheap shots. And it was just you know as bad as it gets. And so this is a very much a around from that. And it's good to see that happening. So it was very satisfying to see that happen. Of course, they did call me that guy in the <laughs> title. Yeah, this guy thinks, <laughs> thinks that. <laughs> Peter said that was the editors who said that's who, who came up with the title. <laughs> There's still uh, room for improvement, but uh, it, it's definitely uh, a big shift. And look, there has not been a central bank study out there supporting the idea that increasing interest rates brings down aggregate demand or slows down the economy. There just hasn't been one. So, like, why not? They've got hundreds of PhDs working for them that churn this stuff out to support their policies. Well, there hasn't been one in maybe 20 years. There used to be papers like that that came out occasionally. And they weren't very uh, conclusive. They would say, you know, there's a high probability that a 1% increase in rates will reduce inflation by a tenth of 1% with a two to four year lag. That's what used to come up. Okay. Well, you know, at least in something in the right direction. They don't even have that anymore. <laughs> That's real tea leaf reading, isn't it? Yeah. And they commission these studies to universities everywhere and they just haven't got a result they can publish that they desire to publish, I think. And yet it's conventional wisdom. Yeah, and so your fringe, I'll call him that just for fun, central banker Richard Werner, he came out with something in maybe 2017 or 18 saying that interest rates lead the economy. You know, they cause it, uh, you raise rates, it causes GDP to go up but not down, you know, or you know, they add to aggregate demand. And he had a fairly comprehensive study that led him to conclude that, which is the same thing I was saying, but he's not Michael Woodford, but he's you know, a central banker who did come up with that. But that's the law. I mean, there's nothing, nothing came out refuting what he was saying. And that's the interesting thing. You wouldn't expect Fed papers to start coming out that say uh, Chairman Powell has it backwards. <laughs> so they just don't come out. But he has to know that because these analysts, half a dozen of them show up at their regular meetings. And it's hard for me to imagine that they don't point out that their studies don't support the idea that rate increases will bring inflation down. But then they get into this credibility thing where they believe that Fed credibility is on the line. And if they lose credibility, inflation just runs away. And that's what happened in Venezuela, Zimbabwe. And so because people believe rate hikes are deflationary, they have to do it to maintain credibility. I mean, that, that's the only possible argument I can think of at this point, And it's not an applicable argument. Is it because if they were to admit that it doesn't work or it, that it's very poor or that the evidence is a bit hazy, they have nothing? Right, which is the actual fact, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they'll have to admit they have nothing. <laughs> right, right. So then they're afraid of what would happen to a world where it was understood that central bankers, you just leave rates at zero. If you raise rates, you're going to make it worse. The best you can do to fight inflation is to leave rates at zero. That's your maximum inflation fight. It's a fact, okay? And it's all the data shows it. So they're afraid, I think, that if they were to admit that, that it would just be chaotic. I mean, that's their entire job, isn't it? Yeah. Look, either you believe in an informed electorate or you don't, right? 
And they don't. And a lot of people don't believe in an informed electorate. And a lot of the electorate doesn't believe in an informed electorate and would rather have, you know, a dictator. You've probably got 30% of the population that would support somebody with dictatorial power. As long as they did what they wanted to do. <laughs> right. Who they thought was their religion or something like that. They would do that because they don't think people are in a position to make good judgments for themselves. And, and you know, that's, that's an interesting discussion in itself. Is representative government viable, you know, in its, you know, conceptually viable when you have an informed electorate? Personally, I believe in an informed electorate, and so I'm doing what I'm doing. And I understand people who don't believe in an informed electorate, and they're doing what they're doing. I'm going to just throw some things at you. Just a couple of points from the article, which you'll be able to address directly. I'm just going to quote the article. Quote, the biggest fly in Mosler's ointment is that while interest income goes up with higher rates, so do interest payments. Well, I'm now going to say, I think you said that. Then he goes on to say, net interest income is only about 3% of national income, which is probably not enough to offset the negative effects of higher rates. Among those negative effects, when rates rise, household wealth tends to fall because stocks, bonds, and housing lose value. Then there's the effect on investment. Even if higher rates don't harm business capital spending, they're a murder on housing construction, which is sensitive to higher mortgage rates. Close quote. What do you say to that? That's part of the story, and you read that part of the story in all the textbooks, and that's probably what he did. He just opened up his Samuelson and quoted right out of it. Right. And it's not wrong. You've got winners and losers. But the winners are, you know, as your debt, public debt goes higher and higher, the interest payments get higher and higher, and government is a net payer of interest to the economy. And at some point, the debt to GDP is high enough where the winners overwhelm the losers by a large margin. And that's what Michael Woodford was saying. That's why he was agreeing with me that there is a point. And he hadn't really looked at his models to determine whether that point was 70% debt to GDP, you know, 100%, 120, which is where we are. I think the UK is at around 195. Back when we were at 60-ish, 55 and 60, I brought this up. That was in the 90s. And I thought at the time that was probably high enough to do it. And the discussion was, well, no, the propensities of, you know, the damage done by higher rates to some people is disproportionate to the benefits to everybody else earning this flood of interest income. And I said, okay, fine. You know, that's a subjective guess that people were making. So I look at the data to see which one seems to be winning. And even back then, it seemed to me that the argument was in my favor, which is why I was making it. And now with debt to GDP at 120%, I think it's overwhelming. So what you have is in the, in the economy away from the government, for every dollar saved, there's a dollar borrowed. Banks have loans and they have deposits and they're equal to the penny. When you include you know, everything in the private sector, they have to be. And so uh, when you raise rates, for example, borrowers are getting hurt, they have to pay more, but savers are being rewarded. They're getting exactly that much more to the penny. And that's savers are lenders. So borrowers are hurt, savers are benefit to the penny. And so the argument is that, well, yes, yeah, savers are help, but they don't spend it all, but borrowers are hurt and it really affects them much more drastically. You know, they cut back more than the savers would increase. And the technical word is that the propensities to spend interest income are higher for borrowers than they are for savers. There's a big difference. And I used to visit the Fed regularly, and there was an uh, officer there named Steve Olner. He was there for a long time. He just retired a few years ago. And his job was to actually do the econometrics and determine how much different these borrowers and lenders were. So the Fed had some idea when they increase or decrease rates, how much the lenders would get hurt and how much the savers would get helped and uh, the lenders would get helped to just see what those actual propensities were. And he said to me, he says, well, you know, we believe and we act accordingly, but we believe that the propensity is much higher for the borrowers, that they're more sensitive to changes in rates than the savers. He said, but you know, I've been doing the econometrics for the last 10 years and I can't detect it. <laughs> so that was Steve. And he was a straight up, honest, you know, academic research guy, very bright guy. He wasn't trying to prove anything. He said, look, we think there's a difference, but it's probably pretty small because I, I just can't detect it. And they're paying me whatever, $150,000 a year back then to try and detect it. Okay. So then you've got the government that's a net payer of interest to the economy, you know, on top of all that. So it zeroes out within the economy for every borrower there's a lender, but the private sector holds 30 trillion of government debt in the form of excess reserves with the Fed and treasury securities. And that's all net, that's all interest income. Okay. Now, as that number gets larger and larger, as a 
percentage of the economy, percentage of GDP. That interest expense, any increases in that overwhelms any differences in propensities of the borrowers and savers, right? It's in all the new Keynesian models. It's in all the general equilibrium models that look for it, that there is some level of debt where suddenly the Fed loses its ability to fight inflation by raising rates because when it raises rates, all the interest the government immediately starts paying out adds to demand, adds to employment, helps employment, and causes more inflation. So that tool doesn't work anymore. Now it's highly regressive. It couldn't be any more regressive. So I'd never recommend that as a way to stimulate the economy by increasing interest payments because it's basic income for people who already have money. You're just paying interest out to people who already have money. That's what interest is in proportion to how much they have. You couldn't imagine a more regressive way to support an economy. But that's what the Fed does every time it raises rates. This whole thing's just insanity right now where they're just ignoring this fire hose of interest income that the Fed is spreading on the economy every time it raises rates. So what difference does it make? Obviously, the UK and the US have engaged in quite a lot of QE recently. And as a result, in the UK, at least, the central bank holds a lot of these bonds. And we know that the government doesn't pay interest on these bonds because it gets returned to the Treasury. So how does that impact on what you're saying about raising rates, increasing demand? It exacerbates it a little bit because when the central bank, Bank of England, buys them, it pays for them by crediting accounts, you know, reserve balances with pounds that weren't there before. Okay, so if you sell your securities, your gilts to the Bank of England, you had a million pounds worth and they pay you a million pounds, your asset has shifted from holding a gilt to holding this overnight balances at the Bank of England. And then when they raise rates, they start paying you interest immediately at the new rate on those funds. It reduces the maturity, the duration of public debt. So it's more of it is short term. So more of it's immediately subject to paying more interest. You don't have to wait for the bonds to mature to get more interest. You get it right away. It's overnight deposits. It's like cash. And so they've substituted cash for bonds that earns interest. So when they raise rates, they just start paying out more interest to all the holders of reserves. So it's the same number of balances, but it's more sensitive to short-term rate increase. So what will happen now when I believe both central banks of the US and the UK are saying that they're going to offload their balance sheet? So basically, I guess, return these bonds to the private sector? Yeah, they're going to sell them and then you'll pay for them with reserves. They'll do it at market levels. So with higher rates, they'll get lower prices from those bonds. Whoever buys them will earn more interest than they would have before the rate hikes. It doesn't really change much of anything, actually. It's just swapped back at market levels. So it's, it's nothing to see there, as they, as they might say. So while we're crossing the pond over to the UK, the Financial Times noted recently that financial markets are betting the Bank of England will more than double interest rates by May next year. So that means rates of 4% are being anticipated. Yeah, let me just say 100% debt to GDP. That means ultimately, in present value terms, they're going to be adding 2% of GDP to state deficit spending for payments of interest to people who have money in proportion to how much they have. That's their operational policy. We're going to double the amount of pounds we're going to pay to people who already have money. We're doubling our basic income payment, and that's going to fight inflation. It's like, excuse me? There's a popular economics blogger over here in the UK who wrote a piece in reaction to this news about the anticipated rate hike. And I just wanted to check the monetary operations descriptions in the piece were consistent with MMT. They wrote the quote, quantitative easing inflated commercial banks' cash balances. Okay, so can I just stop you there for a second? Okay, cash balances went on. Now, they say inflated. Why did he use that word? Because they're just trying to be sensational, right? Okay, so yeah, when the government buys your bonds and pays you, your cash balance goes up and the balance in your securities account goes down. If you had savings accounts in Barclays and they came due and they put the money in your checking account, your savings balance goes down and your checking balance goes up. It's okay. I mean, nobody even takes notice, right? So to carry on the quote, this was money the government effectively spent into the economy and never taxed back. Yeah, but I mean, it did spend it, but it bought your securities. Yeah. So we would say swapped. Yeah. You know, if you buy a financial asset, it's different than if you buy goods and services. Spending normally is applies to goods and services, but it's not technically wrong to say it spent it, but it, it was uh, an exchange. It didn't change the net financial assets in the system. It didn't change anybody's wealth or anything to sell a million pounds worth of gilts to get a million pounds in your bank account. You're, you're even. Okay. Let me try that again. This was money the government effectively spent into the economy and never taxed back, meaning it stayed with the commercial banks instead. And they, the commercial banks, have saved it with the Bank of England. Yeah, it's sitting in their account at the Bank of England. And the gilts and securities accounts has gone down. I think that's the missing piece. Yeah, the other thing is it's not the banks 
that sold the securities. It's other agents in the economy who are customers of the banks. And so the banks have balances at the central bank, Bank of England, as an asset. And on the liability side, they have deposits that are owned by their clients. So you might have had a large pension fund that sold the securities. The money goes to their account at Barclays at the Bank of England. So Barclays has that money at the Bank of England. But the pension fund has that money in their account at Barclays. So it's at the Bank of England, but it's for further credit to the pension fund. So they're acting as an agent for the pension fund that actually sold the securities. So Barclays itself isn't any richer or anything like that. They're just the broker here. So that kind of feeds into the next passage that I just wanted to check with you. And this is kind of where it ends. Quote, the Bank of England pays its bank base rate on these deposits. Let me just say yes. But then Barclays has to pay the pension funds the rate. So again, it's a pass-through because it's competitive. If they don't, another bank will. So then we go on to say, when the rate paid by the Bank of England was 0.1% not very long ago, that meant that the cost of these cash deposits, effectively paid by the government, was less than $1 billion a year. If the interest rate moves to 4%, the cost will exceed $36 billion a year. And that's all profit to the commercial banks that will be entirely paid for by our government. Okay, so to the extent that those deposits are for further credit to the pension fund, you know, banks with assets and liabilities, they have to pay at least the same amount of interest generally to their depositors. They're also going to lose the money and they'll go to another bank. And so only to the extent that Barclays itself is in a net long cash position will they earn the extra interest. And I'm not sure how much that is. It's probably something, but it's not particularly large. So that whole figure, $36 billion, is not... You know, it's sensational. What he's saying is sensational. He's just not fully aware of the uh, monetary operations. He gets part of it and he gets a lot of it right, but there's still elements that escape him and that he uh, gets wrong. And you know, as, as I broke that down, you can see how it's kind of a mixture where the things that aren't technically wrong, but their implications are not what he thinks they are. It is bad policy, but I don't think it's bankers bribing the Bank of England to give them more money because they, like you just said, they don't get the money. It's a pass-through, right? That's right. Well, they, they were asking for a higher interest rates for a very long time. <laughs> before before it actually happened. Yeah, they do have excess customer balances that just kind of sit there that they used to make a fair amount on when rates were high. And then when the rates went to zero, that ceased to be a source of income for them. Look, the banks are agents of the legislature, right? So if the banks are bad, it's because the legislature's made them bad and regulations made them bad. It's a failure of government. The responsibility is always with the government. They're fully regulated and fully supervised. You know, it's like if the military is bad, you know, you blame it on the government, right? The banking system should be held accountable the same way the military is. So turning the corner, recently the US Senate passed a budget reconciliation bill called the Inflation Reduction Act. Have you had time to look at it, Warren? Just superficially. You know, the name itself, obviously, why did they name it that? It's just just political, right? If your bill was entirely to reduce inflation, that probably wouldn't have been it. Well, that was going to answer my next question, which was, do you think it will reduce inflation? Well, it's tiny, right? It's $700 billion over... 10 years or something. And uh, it supposedly has deficit reduction in there of about $300 billion. So to the extent that that reduces demand, you would think that would be a deflationary bias, you know, to be taking money out of the system. But again, it's tiny over 10 years and a lot of it's delayed. And it's indirect. Okay, corporate tax increases indirectly reduce demand. There are a few things in there to support, I guess, the Green New Deal, you'd call it. And a lot of those are ultimately, while I support them, they're, you know, they decrease productivity. It takes more labor and materials to produce the same amount of energy or whatever the output is from the program than it does otherwise. And that raises costs. So that makes, you know, those things relevant more expensive. And so I would call it inflation reduction. Now, it might be inflation reduction in the sense that what it's replacing is going to get more expensive. And so you kind of have the counterfactual of that by using less oil, which is going to get more expensive or helping inflation. So you know, I can't say it's wrong or anything like that. So through the MMT lens, we would say unemployment above zero is evidence that the government deficit is too small. And the Inflation Reduction Act is explicitly aimed at deficit reduction. So this legislation is playing into the narrative that government deficits cause inflation. So it's wrong in that sense, but at a practical level, does it actually do that? I can't say it does. So in that sense, yeah, doing something to cause unemployment to go up can be deflationary in the right environment, but you also lose economies of scale. So when demand goes down, it costs more to build per car when you build fewer cars than when you build more cars, for example, or more you know, bolts or whatever you're making, or even in the service sector, if you're selling fewer programs, if people are downloading fewer songs on your thing, you know, it costs you more per song. So we have a lot of infinite leverage, you know, in our economies of scale or infinite zero margin 
marginal cost things out there. So to reduce demand isn't necessarily reducing in the price level anymore. And on top of that all, MMT is the only school of thought out there that actually has identified the source of the price level and what makes it change. None of the others have that. They're all looking at things like inflation expectations, which Fed studies have already shown don't make a difference. And something like this can reduce inflation expectations if people believe that it's going to work. And so people who still believe in inflation expectations would say, therefore, it brings inflation down. Kind of like Powell at the Fed might, Joe Powell might believe that raising rates reduces inflation expectations, even though his own studies show that doesn't matter. And so therefore, it becomes deflationary under this discredited narrative that inflation expectations matter. On that issue of MMT saying who sets the price level and this idea that the government sets the price level through stating what it's going to exchange for the thing that the issues. Yeah, it's a monopolist, monopolist set price. It's micro 101. It's the first thing you learn. It takes 15 minutes. So in practice, usually when the government accepts a higher price, as you say, it's usually because the market in inverted commas is, is asking for a higher price and the government agrees to that. Is the government in any position to say... Say if it needs additional workers to say, no, I'm just going to pay this. What would be the alternative approach? Yeah, I mean, it can do that. And it's kind of an ugly process and the prices will come down. So government contracting is set up to be competitive and whatnot. And whoever is deciding who to hire and when is looking at what their effect is going to be. And, and so how you do these things matters a lot. And so when you have countries that are more aggressive and just buying whatever they want, whatever the price is, you'll see, you know, the price level will be shifting much more rapidly. And the U.S., the base level of price shifting due to those factors you're talking about has been around 2% historically for a long time now. And it's kind of baked into how the government spends and what it does when it hires and what it does when it contracts and what requirements it puts on contractors. The contractors are all in a position to uh, try to maximize profits, so they want their costs as low as possible, so they're not going to go out and pay higher prices for labors or materials or anything like that. And so that whole process has resulted in relative price stability. Now, of course, you get into a war or something like like that. The government now needs 10,000 new missiles for their rocket launchers or something. And they just go out and pay whatever. And they have an unlimited budget to pay whatever it takes. You're going to get more pressure on the price level with, with that kind of a policy, right? Rather than one that's cost sensitive and price sensitive. So it's all part of the total institutional structure. Because uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, Sam Levy's model on this specifically. You know, I did. And I talked to him about it. And I think the model's okay. But the model comes with a narrative on the model. You know, I, I would question the narrative. He says, well, you're right. But in the model, it's the way you say. So I'll, I'll take his word for it. Because he talks about a, a primary kind of seller, the government being the, the, the monopoly issuer of the currency. But they're also existing kind of a secondary market for dollars that are already out there, let's say. And what I like about it is that eventually, the secondary market comes into whatever the government is doing because it has no choice. Okay, but look, when you have unemployment, it means there aren't as many dollars, quote, out there saved as desired. And so there's a shortage, which is a deflationary bias. If you had a job guarantee, then it would be neutral, the dollars out there. Right. If you had a job guarantee or you pushed beyond 2% or zero and spent beyond that, well, then, then the dollars out there are continuously adjusting the price level lower. And, you know, he'll agree with me when I tell you this narrative, and, and, and it might contradict something in his narrative, but then he says, but what you just said is that is how the model works. What I liked about it is that what you explained about it, yes, the government can do some things, but it's hard to do it. And this idea that eventually the private sector has to come in line with what the government is offering, but it may take a while to do that and it may cause some problems. So there's an incentive for the government to just simply fall in line with whatever the private... You know. Right. Particularly when there's no real cost to increasing the price level. It's, just, it's a distributional issue, which fiscal policy takes care of. And I touched on Turkey about that. It can be used effectively for a progressive of agenda. So there's no real cost to just paying the higher prices and letting the price level reset at a higher level. So if you have an institutional structure that's forcing you to pay higher prices and you're resetting the price level upwards, value of the currency downwards by 2% a year, you know, there's no cost, real economic cost. So to fight that, there might be a real economic cost of disruption and everything else, the lack of demand that, you know, hurts your whole economy. So from a real cost basis, it might be beneficial to everybody to simply allow the price level to go up, given the, the institutional structure. Now, you could change the institutional structure. You could change the contracting processes. You could change regulation of monopolies in the economy. And you could change our enforcement and do things like that. And that would certainly help keep the price level from going high. Or you can just let it go higher, in which case, again, there's no cost, but there are distributional consequences. And then it, those are fairly easy to address. The problem is people don't like inflation. 
And if you take that path, even though everybody's better off and everybody's wealthier and their standard of living's up, you're going to get run out of office because you uh, devalued the currency or robbing people's savings or whatever they do. So what's politically successful is not necessarily what optimizes prosperity and social equity. I was just going to say maybe this is a bright spot, but maybe you guys will tell me otherwise. But the Inflation Reduction Act does aim to lower prices through the prices paid by government in terms of Medicare drugs. Sounds like MMT. Yeah. So that prescription drug thing is all my fault, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Have you heard the backstory on this? No. So it's 2003, maybe the election was 2004, and George Bush is running and the economy's bad, you know, after the crash, after the recession. And I had this car company, the MT900, and on my board is a guy named Dave McClellan from General Motors and Joe Zymek from Ford, and he was the head of Corvette for 17 years, a super nice guy. And I was talking about the economy and what needed to be done. And he said, well, you know, we know Andy Card. So Andrew Card was the uh, chief of staff for George Bush, and he was a former General Motors engineer, and they'd worked together. So he says, I'm going to try to get you a meeting with with Andy, and you guys can talk. He's a sharp guy. So I said, okay. So he sets up a meeting at the White House in the West Wing, and Elizabeth and I, my wife, we we go to the White House, you know, to meet with Andrew Card. And we walk by all the photographers. Of course, they don't take our picture or anything like that. And then we're in the waiting room, and he's late, and they have a bowl of miniature Snickers bars, which Elizabeth puts in her purse (laughs) for souvenirs. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then uh, we go into the meeting and he's a quick study, super nice guy. They cut interest rates to 1%. And I explained to him why that isn't going to help. Same thing, interest income story. And he goes, yeah, why would anybody think this is going to work? And it wasn't. You know, the economy was bad. Then we talked about the budget deficits and how the accounts worked. And he picked it up right away. And he goes, well, it, you know, how big does this deficit have to get? And it was about $200 billion or something at the time. I said, I think it's got to get to five, six percent of GDP. It's got to get to seven or eight hundred billion, you know, to turn this around. And see, they're going to get there proactively. It's going to get there the ugly way. Just say what you mean by the ugly way. Well, the ugly way would be unemployment compensation because the economy is so bad. It was a running, running deficit and uh, welfare, you know, uh, the transfer payments picking up for unemployment compensation, welfare, all these payments that go up in a recession because unemployment was high. I said, all right, you know, to turn this around proactively with either tax cuts or spending increases. And he said, you know, how much does it need to be? And I said, I don't know, maybe seven or eight hundred billion. He says, We don't have much time, do we? I said, No. <laughs> so it was a it was a half hour meeting that ran forty five minutes. And he, he, you know, he's an engineer, he's right on top of his stuff. And he said, Thank you very much. And I got a nice letter from him afterwards. And within a week or so, somebody asked President Bush about the deficit. And I wasn't like a Bush supporter or anything, but it's you know, it's the president. I want as an American, I wanted to see us do better. And uh, the president said, he says, Look, I don't look at numbers on a piece of paper, I look at jobs. That was a quote right out of it. I'm sure it came right from the meeting. And uh, after that, he did not veto a single spending bill. That's when they increased Medicare. They did prescription drugs for everybody. They were just trying to spend as much money as possible. They did every tax cut possible. They had retroactive tax cuts to the year before where they're sending everybody money back. And by the third quarter, the deficit got up to $200 billion, which was enough to turn the economy and keep it from costing him the election. I won't say gave him the election, but it kept him from costing the election. And of course, we, we all prospered and did better. So we're still got this prescription drug thing. The Republicans hated it. Bush was behind it because he was just trying to get the deficit up, recognizing, you know, the importance of doing that. And I think somewhere during that time is when Cheney said something about deficits don't matter or something like that. I didn't talk to Cheney, so I'll assume that came from Card, but maybe he said it before that meeting. I don't remember the timing on that. But I do know that, you know, that was one for one timing. And that's how we got to this prescription drugs to begin with this because prescription drugs cost 10 times great. Let's go there. We need to spend the money. It was a wild spending free for all like nobody had ever seen before. Are there other prices that spring to mind that the government could cut down on without causing that ugly deflation that you were talking about? Well, look, if you look at the problematic inflation, it's been, I'll say, 100% energy. It's not 100, it's probably 80% because we had a one-time shift because of our supply side issues with COVID. And then we've got the tariffs. They can roll those back. I mean, you know, President Trump put a 17% tariff on Canadian lumber because they weren't charging us enough. I mean, would you send this guy out shopping for you if you do something? (laughs) And then Biden thought that was not only a great idea, he doubled it to 34%. So here we have an administered 34% increase on the wholesale level. I don't know what that is on a retail. 
to them. And he reported lumber. And they go, oh, housing prices are up. We have to do something about that. Well, you just did something about it. You raised them by you know, increasing the cost of the lumber by 34%. You know, it's just an administered price increase. And so now we have to reverse that. But we don't want inflation. We want prices to go up because Canada's not charging us enough, but we don't want inflation. It's like, okay. you know, So they're talking out of both sides of their mouth. I think one Fed report estimated all that was worth 0.3 or something. And the rest was all this energy thing. And of course, you had President Trump threatening the Saudis in 2020, I think, when oil price had collapsed because of COVID, backed by legislation from Republicans that threatened to cut off military aid to Saudi Arabia if they did not immediately cut production and get the price of oil higher because it was hurting the U.S. oil industry. <laughs> so, okay, so if you want to know where all this started from, it's right there. You know, this, these are headlines for a long time. And it totally alienated Saudi Arabia. They didn't want to hear that. And they wound up getting together with Russia, OPEC Plus. They did cut two and a half million barrels each to stop the drop. And then they started setting their OSPs higher to push prices up. And that's been causing price increases ever since. And so now with oil stabilized now at about 90-ish for two months, you've seen month over month change in CPI back around zero. And inflation's over unless oil goes back up. So the biggest thing to do would be to stabilize that price, to stabilize consumer price index. That will stabilize it, and that will end the whole inflation discussion. But again, you know, the environmentalists want a higher price, the green side, because they don't want people to use it. And uh, we're spending this money to transition, and then at the same time, we're trying to get the price stabilized, and we know there's a shortage coming up, so we want more production of oil and gas when we're trying to transition. You know, they don't have a consistent policy here. So again, tell me what outcome you want, and I'll tell you how to do it. But we do not have a consistent policy from either side on any of the major issues right now. They're just talking out of both sides of their mouths on almost every major issue. And that's where it stands right now. So right now, the CPI will stay constant if oil prices stay here. Do you want them to do that? And will they? I don't think they will. I think we're on the way to 250 or $300 oil, which would be you know, a tripling of prices here. You'll get natural gas prices in Europe, they're the equivalent of between $500 and $1,000 a barrel for oil. And you see power companies shifting from gas to oil. So I think it's going up and I think we're going to see another surge in CPI. And if they raise rates, it's just going to exacerbate the problem by paying more money out, throwing gasoline on the fire. Especially as we're going into winter as well. Yeah. In the past, you've talked about how it makes very little sense to leave oil prices to the spot market. And then it might make sense to come to longer term arrangements you talk about that? Yeah, back in the time, oil was 50 or $60 a barrel, and there was enough Canadian oil and Mexican oil to supply the U.S. needs. And we were in a position where the government could have negotiated with Canada and with Mexico for a 30-year contract at $70 a barrel plus CPI increase or something like that. And that would have been enough for them to justify the investments needed to supply us with that amount of oil. And the price would have been stable, and we would have not had this whipsaw in consumer prices due to energy prices. The risk is, to them, if oil went a lot higher, they were leaving money on the table. And if the price went lower, we were overpaying or something like that. But, you know, in exchange for dead solid stability for 20 or 30 years, I mean, it was all there to be done. But there was no discussion or thought about that whatsoever. Other commodities, it's very different. So if China wants to buy meat, they don't just go into the spot market. They fly a delegation down to Argentina. They talk about how much they want over 20 or 30 years. They go out and look at the land, you know, where it's going to be raised and what the investment is. And then they contract with Argentina who makes the investment at a price that's favorable to both sides. And then they start raising cattle and selling them cattle for the next 30 years. And so most commodities at that level are done long-term contractual basis as much as possible. In oil, it's just all left in the spot market. And we continue to have this volatility that is highly problematic with no sign of it ending until we recognize the advantages of contracting longer term. I don't know what else to tell you. I guess they'd call that socialism if the government did that, right? <laughs> yeah. And it would be your fault. Obviously, everything's your fault. But it's my fault. Yeah. Be <laughs> um, in light of the fact that a Chicago businessman just gave $1.6 billion to a foundation that's been funding efforts to reshape the US judiciary into an even more conservative set of institutions than they already are, I thought it might be a good time to just ask you to recap your 60-40 campaign finance rule. Yeah, right. So under that rule, he can give us $1.6 billion, but you know, 40% of that, which is how much for $640 billion would go to the opposition and the rest would go to those. So they'd have equal money to fight it. And so he can't drown out voices with those kinds of distribution. And there's no government money involved. And if he realized that's what was happening, he might not do it at all. <laughs> I think it's a genius idea in its simplicity as well. And 60-40 is my opening remarks. It could be, you know, 55, 45, whatever. 
Unfortunately, we're out of time, so that's where we'll have to leave it for now. But thanks so much, Warren. We've been speaking with MMT founder Warren Mosler, and we'll link to where you can stay current with his work in the show notes for this episode. But for now, thanks so much for joining us once again today on the MMT podcast, Warren Mosler. Anytime. Thank you, guys. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you. So he's the ex-chancellor of the exchequer. Yes. Well, that actually, that's two negatives. That makes him the chancellor of the checker. <laughs> <laughs>